Hello, my name is Jodie Brunning. Today with PSTR, we're speaking to Professor Ian Brighthope. Ian has an, an extraordinary career. He was the founding president of ACNAM, the principal lecturer up until 2007. Before that, he had established the Bright Hope Clinics and Biocenters, uh, it, which was the first integrative medicine center in Australia and actually coined the term integrative medicine. He's president of the Complementary Healthcare Council of Australia, the peak industry body for complementary medicines. I think that was in the past. Um, and you're currently a director of the National Institute of Integrative Medicine. And as well, you're, you're established, you were a, a past president, a founding president of ACNAM, and you're just in the process right now of establishing the world of wellness, which is a, an amazing initiative. Welcome, Professor Brighthope. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Jody. It's a pleasure to be with you. And just one little correction there. I was a director of the National Institute of Integrative Medicine. I'm the director of nutritional and environmental medicine at the National Institute of Integrative Medicine. So just to make things uh, precise. Yeah. Thank you for the correction. I'm very grateful. I, I, was, I was director. You were quite right. <laughs> but, uh... And um, so you're, you're quite fascinating because your, your career started looking at animal biology, animal health and animal nutrition. My own backgrounds are in agribusiness and we found out we went to the same ag college, which is great. And so that is, that's quite fascinating because you really, really look at nutrition and biology in agricultural science. Yes. I mean, uh, it's been a very interesting journey for me, uh, Jody. I, uh, I was interested in uh, agriculture and foods. Um, my grandfather was a chef. He also had uh, um, grew his own uh, vegetables and so on. Uh, he was a chef in Europe and uh, well known. Uh, and I thought uh, doing agriculture, uh, agricultural science would be uh, something up my alley. And uh, I certainly enjoyed it and certainly learned a lot. In fact, I learned the basics of biological systems, you know, from the microbe of the soil, from the soil to the psyche and from the psyche to, uh, um, uh, disease if you like um, and therein lies uh, the early part of my journey because after finished ag science I went and did some animal husbandry I looked after um, foods and feeding of uh, livestock and designed foods and did some research in, in uh, animal nutrition and uh, then uh, I met some interesting people that were doctors and I thought I could do some doctoring and so that's when I went into medicine uh, and uh, during my medical career, the, the basic sciences I loved. Uh, but when we got into clinical work, uh, I just couldn't understand what we were doing with patients. Because with sick patients, we were basically giving them drugs, and, uh, intravenous salt and sugar solutions, ice cream and jelly for, for cancer patients for their dinner. It was just unbelievable, the, uh, the abuse that I, I saw uh, patients receiving in terms of their nutritional status. And, uh, you know, I had an argument with uh, my professors and, you know, it was a frustrating time for me and I said I'm not going to be a doctor like you uh, I'm going to be doing something different that's when uh, I went into, into ordinary medicine for a couple of years and I loved anesthetics and intensive care and and so I got a lot of experience there but uh, eventually um, traveled around the world looking at alternative healthcare systems and and what people did overseas you know all, all over the place and uh, discovered that um, there were other people around who uh, thought along my lines as well. These orthodox doctors had never done anything in terms of nutrition. Uh, so we formed an organisation called the Orthomolecular Medical Association of Australia. People didn't understand the term orthomolecular, so I pushed to change to nutritional medicine. Then we tagged on environmental after that because you can't talk about nutrition without environment. And so that's where ACNAM came from. And uh, it's over 40, 20, 24, it's 20, well, it's 44 years old. Uh, and these courses before. are actively taken by <laughs> clinical clinicians, by medical doctors, by general practitioners to add on to the, the body of knowledge they already know about from a, a general, gen, generic medical degree, so, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, I mean, the, the basic medical degree is very helpful, um, but it doesn't teach them anything about the basic building blocks of life, the nutrients. And that's where uh, Ackman comes in and uh, teaches them all about the nutrients that are going to prevent disease treat disease, reverse degenerative disease, uh, and help uh, um, patients with severe problems like cancer, heart disease, uh, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, help them to uh, either 
cure their disease or uh, to develop a, a better uh, lifestyle uh, and therefore health uh, and uh, a greater prognosis in terms of survival and the rejection of risks of complications. So, and, and you just talked about uh, metabolic syndrome there, which is a cluster of, uh, of different illnesses. And we know in New Zealand that multimorbidity is actually more common than having a single disease. So this is where the work you're doing can be quite powerful because instead of a pill for every ill, you're addressing the body rather than a, a specific uh, symptom of a specific disease. Yeah, Jody, the the body is an interesting thing. It's not just a heart or a brain or a bone. It's a collection of uh, trillions of cells and tissues and um that they all have requirements for water and oxygen. Uh, they all need to be detoxed. They all have um, biochemical pathways that require uh, complex uh, carbo um, uh, carbo carbohydrates, hydrocarbons, uh, nitrogen, uh, etc. But these pathways also require enzymes, and those enzymes are proteins that require cofactors. And those cofactors are, by a funny strange of uh, coincidence, happen to be things like magnesium, zinc. And copper and, and uh, fascinating things like pyridoxine, uh, niacin, vitamins, minerals, essential uh, trace elements, um, and so on. So uh, every system in the body is affected. And therefore, it depends on your genetics, whether or not you're going to get diabetes or metabolic syndrome or heart disease, but they're all interrelated because the, fa the fundamentals are due uh, to um, the biochemistry. And if we mess up the biochemistry, then we mess up the, the genes and the genes don't express themselves correctly. And so nutrigenomics and, and uh, the, the whole thing about epigenetics, uh, we've, I've been talking about it even before it became popular uh, because we know that these diseases can be halted, uh, reversed or slowed down uh, if the lifestyle is changed. Exercise is one of the most important things. Sunlight is another very important thing. Um, you know, the sunlight takes the information from the sun via vitamin D to all of the receptors in the deepest parts of our system. So and this is every cell. Every cell of the body, virtually, apart from red blood cells, um, every other cell virtually has uh, vitamin D receptors. And uh, they are, abs it's basically saying to every cell in the body, you're not, you're not a, a single cell organism anymore living in a pond where you're getting sunlight. Uh, you're deep inside somebody's gut and brain and heart. And therefore, we've got to de deliver the energy inf um, influences from uh, sunlight. It's it's it really is uh, uh, very very important. It's 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 more interesting to me than rocket science, and it's more complex than rocket science. Uh, and <clears throat> let me tell you that with comorbidities of three or four more comorbidities, you can actually treat each of those uh, disease states uh, in a very similar way. You know, they respond to say, all of them basically respond to vitamin C, all of them respond to some of the trace elements. Uh, and when when you can, can think this way, then it makes it easier to understand the disease process. You know, inflammation in one tissue is the same as inflammation in the other tissue. And the resolution of inflammation doesn't occur with anti-inflammatories, it occurs when you provide the process with the building blocks to stop the inflammation, repair the tissue damage, uh, and you know, essentially uh, eliminate the inflammatory response. So it, it's it's lovely medicine, but it's not medicine. It's real health care. It, it, uh, uh, I mean, we are trained to think and act in terms of diseases as doctors. And that's all. We're not trained to think and act in terms of making patients healthy because a healthy population, uh, they don't use too many drugs. They don't do, use too many medicines. So a healthy population is not going to be in the best interest of, um, you know, the pharmaceutical company down the road who wants to make a profit. Yeah, and it's sometimes difficult not to be cynical. And when you were talking about the cofactors, this is also important for our neurotransmitters, all the hormones in the brain. So the, the cofactors, the removing the inflammation, providing adequate nutrients, uh, for example, uh, you know, supporting a healthy, uh, you know, carbohydrate level, 
Uh, this also benefits the brain as well as the body. So this is something that we don't see in the at the medical in medical universities. That pulling together right. the brain, mental and multi morbid. The, the, this is I've put that very badly. Pulling together the body and the brain to establish what is how do we reverse lots of different illnesses. Yeah, I think that's what I was referring to before, uh, Jody, uh, from soil to psyche. I mean, uh, where did all of our nutrients come for the brain or the or, or the mind or what or the psyche? Uh, where do they come from? They come from the soil. Are, are they uh, some of them, of course, come from the seawater or the sea by, by fish and uh, seafoods, but most come from the soil. And if the soil is deficient in something, when we we end up with a disease, and you know, we have the nutrient deficient soils all around Australia. Uh, and then we process the foods and they lose the nutrients that way as well. Uh, and the brain uh, needs a lot of nutrients to function. It uses a huge amount of energy uh, and it uses a lot of uh, oxygen. It uses a lot of glucose and these processes require the cofactors and without them, the, uh, the uh, I mean, I, I talk about psychiatric illness and uh, mental illness as being either uh, an excess or deficiency of nutrients in the central nervous system and toxicity. Those two things, uh, nutrients, nutrient depletion, imbalance, and toxicity. And if causing uh, the psychiatric illness at the root cause, you'll always discover toxin or toxins, and you'll always discover deficiencies of nutrients or excesses of some nutrients. Yeah, you know, I, I just think uh, when when you when you look at a patient from that perspective, you've got a much more difficult task in helping them than just prescribing a drug that's going to you know psychiatrically, uh, chemically straight uh, you know, or uh, dumb them down or numb them down. You know, uh, and, and we, it, it's not. And we particularly see these peak times in terms of uh, physiological or mental stress. So in adolescence, in, in large growth growth periods, we see it post-pregnancy. Uh, post and you, you will also see it in people that have, for example, gone to war, they've been massively stressed. So uh, as Julia Rutledge has found out, that they, they don't have the resilience if they don't have the adequate nu nutrition. So how do you... How do you talk about this added added requirement, say, in pregnancy, please? The added requirements in pregnancy, of course. I mean, the, the, the baby gets the priority with regard to uh, uh, many nutrients. Uh, and a, a woman certainly doesn't want to go into uh, a pregnancy uh, with deficiency of nutrients, uh, B vitamins in particular, uh, iron and zinc in particular, uh, because um, these things are taken up by the baby and can cause the woman to be uh, become ill or anemic or weak uh, and often uh, not functioning correctly. And we give pregnant women folic acid and, uh, and iron uh, during the pregnancy. Well, that's brilliant. But what about all the other B vitamins? I mean, she, she needs all the other B vitamins. A folic acid doesn't work by itself. It needs B12. And again, B12 can become deficient in, in pregnancy. The baby takes it up. Um, Iron also, I mean, interferes with the uptake of, uh, of zinc and vice versa. And zinc is a very important growth uh, compound, very important for the immune system, very important for the baby. And it's been shown that uh, zinc deficiencies produce poorer outcomes and zinc supplementation actually improves the outcome of the pregnancy, improves the labor, improves the high pass score. It improves the baby's uh, uh, early uh, early few days. So we, we do need to seriously look at all of these nutrients uh, during pregnancy. A nutrient-dense diet is very, very important uh, and a, a very wide variety of foods is also extremely important and avoiding foods that cause malabsorption such as you know high levels of uh, gluten in the diet and gluten sensitivity is very well known now but gluten uh, and the grains the uh, and beans for example can actually bind onto some of these nutrients and compromise the uptake uh, and again it, that comes back to uh, how healthy is the gut? How healthy is the inside of the gut? And I mean, everybody is talking about the microbiome now. Um, the microbiome is everywhere and everybody's talking about the microbiome, but it is it's absolutely critical to keep the microbiome healthy. And uh, I have to say, uh, during COVID, 
uh, and long COVID, um, people's microbiomes have been completely messed up either by the, uh, the virus or the, um, the, the vaccines. Uh, they can actually uh, cause havoc with regard to the microbiome. That's why so many people are not well uh, following, um, following COVID. So it's uh, I'm getting away from the the, uh, the pregnancy thing, but uh, really, um, pregnancy is a time when uh, nutrients and nutrition uh, are an extremely important for the mother, for future mother. But that it's before pregnancy also that um, the periconceptual nutrition, not just of the, the female but also of the male, which is very important for the health of the sperm and the egg before they meet. That's particularly, yeah, I've looked at that in terms of sort of epigenetics and endocrine disruption. I, you know, I don't have a science background. My, my research was in sociology, but in order to speak to a bunch of scientists about it, I had to I had to learn about that. And then, for example, in pregnancy, if we're talking about this as an example, what about selenium and iodine? Well, they're, they're both uh, absolutely essential. Um, iodine, of course, for thyroid function and for growth. Um, and development of the, uh, the infant and the infant's brain. Uh, selenium is one of my favorite trace elements because uh, I studied that when I was uh, uh, doing ag science, uh, did a project on selenium and selenium deficiencies. And we know that selenium deficiencies in our soils in Victoria and certainly in New, uh, in New Zealand as well, uh, probably contributing to, to New Zealand's high level of inflammatory bowel disease, one of the highest in the world, I believe, in your uh, incidence of ulcerative colitis. Um, and uh, it's never, ever looked at. But when you look at selenium, uh, deficiencies in animals produce white muscle disease. And when these animals are slaughtered, the, uh, the veal is white. And it's very popular. It was very popular in the restaurants, the fancy restaurants back in the 60s and 70s. But the, the poor animals also have a condition called cardiomegaly, which is an enlarged heart, an enlarged and failing heart. And it didn't, it didn't strike me until after I'd graduated and got into uh, private practice and started my nutritional medicine that I had even twigged that selenium deficiency may be responsible for cardiomegaly and, uh, uh, in, um, in, uh, adult, in, uh, in, in humans. Uh, and I had uh, patients coming to me who were on the list for a transplant. They're in cardiac failure on, on the cardiac failure medications. Uh, and I did selenium tests and found that there was no selenium in their hair, in their nails, and in their blood, or very little. They were severely deficient. And these patients, they, only, they didn't just need selenium. This shows you how nutrients work together. By the time they developed their um, uh, uh, cardiomegaly or their, their um, heart failure, uh, massive hearts that were failing, they had other biochemical um, um, disturbances uh, and imbalances and they needed other nutrients as well but it was just the selenium which was the root cause the selenium deficiency was the root cause of their problem and they needed a lot of selenium and we got some of these patients off the transplant list and we were able to reduce some of their medication for, ca uh, for cardiac failure that's so, amazing so, yeah. so and with respect to the the amounts of selenium that are needed or vitamin D or zinc, what would you have to say about the, the recommended levels that uh, the Ministry of Health, that, that, that health departments recommend for each of these elements? Have you, have you looked into that? Yes, I have. And uh, I mean, uh, it's all political. Um, uh, you know, the, the system uh, is not conducive to good health. The system is very much uh, geared towards industry uh, and in particular, the pharmaceutical industry. The industry is the determining body with regard to many of these things, either directly or indirectly. The, the so-called experts they have advising government departments about the levels of nutrients is they are very, very, very are cautious about the dosage and the intake and they prescribe just enough to prevent overt deficiency disease in the majority of the population. They don't recommend the levels that uh, doctors and others should be using to correct diseases or prevent disease in genetically susceptible people. So, you know, if somebody uh, has got a low level of 
selenium, for example. We call it idiopathic hypertrophic cardiomegaly. Or, um, uh, it, it's just basically an enlarged heart and it's idiopathic, which means we don't know what the cause is. That's what we say in medicine. It's idiopathic. We don't know the cause. But when you start looking at looking deeper, digging deeper, you find a lot of the causes for people's problems are nutritional and nutritionally related. And, you know, the selenium thing makes sense because animals deprived of selenium getting um, large hearts, we're, we're another animal and our hearts need selenium. Especially uh, with the mammalian, the mammalian studies will um, yeah. can often lead us down that yeah. way. Yeah. And so, so if, but if you're a, a young doctor, you've graduated two or three years ago and you, you suspect uh, that nutrition might may be a role, you'll be you'll be hesitant to give large doses because I'm aware that, for example, many of the trials with vitamin D, if the patients weren't supplement, supplemented sufficiently to, to raise their serum levels, they weren't going to respond. So they would say, you know, we gave the patient 200 nanomole or, 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 you know, 100. But if it's not enough to correct the deficiency, have you seen a lot of this? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, it was classic at the beginning of uh, COVID, for example. I mean, I've, I've been through so many epidemics. Um, Swine flu, uh, pig flu, uh, bird flu, SARS, COV one, SARS COV two. Um, every time there's been an epidemic, we and I say we, usually myself through Acnum uh, and all the other groups, recommended uh, supplementation with C, D, and zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc, minimum. Uh, and with respect to the vitamin D, in terms of prevention, D for defense, the recommendations were at least 4,000 international units per day for the average adult. But you should, if you are at risk, have your blood vitamin D measures, so my plasma le uh, levels measured. And if they're below 100 and, uh, 110 nanomoles per liter, you should supplement and bring it up to about 130 to 140 nanomoles per litre. That's if you're at risk. If you're a healthy individual, not at risk, you should have the levels around about 120, 125 nanomoles per litre. If you're severe at risk, severely at risk, and you've got an autoimmune disease or cancer, you should be looking at taking them up to 170, 180 nanomoles per litre or even higher. So it's the, it depends on the individual, Jody, what doses you actually prescribe and their needs so, and also vitamin D is the sunlight vitamin, but we should also have sunlight because sunlight actually stimulates other metabolic processes in our skin and our bodies. So it's not just vitamin D alone, but vitamin D is absolutely critical for preventing uh, these infections. And at, at the National Institute, we did a study on, um, on the progression of uh, COVID in, in patients who had COVID. And we had to do the study in tertiary institutions in, uh, in Turkey, uh, because there was not the uh, wherewithal in Australia to do the studies, but we, we showed quite clearly if you had your vitamin, if people were sick and admitted to hospital, they never had a vitamin D level above 70. And if they were low, extremely low, they were extremely sick and they ended up in intensive care. And one patient out of the, the whole group that we did, uh, she was a, a lady with less than 10 nanomoles per litre and she passed away probably from other reasons as well. But the other thing that we discovered uh, with the vitamin D and COVID is that patients who uh, didn't have enough vitamin D and were sick enough to go have to be admitted into intensive care, if they were given high dose intravenous vitamin C in intensive care, they were out of intensive care far quicker. So, I mean, it's uh, we've known that for a long, long time. I mean, uh, we go back to stories of... Um, a dairy farmer in Auckland Hospital who uh, was on ECMO and uh, they were going to turn him off after six weeks and let him die. He had swine flu and his family insisted that the hospital, through the lawyers, uh, give him high doses of intravenous vitamin C. Of course, his life was saved and uh, he, I think he's still alive now. This was back in 29, 2009, 2010, somewhere around about that time. So it... Uh, 
Th these things work and we know that they work and we know they work very, very well. And when things work very well and you place medications, that's when we have opposition. Uh, and the opposition, very political, very uh, uh, um, profit um, motivated. Of course, they've got to be profit motivated for the shareholders, but there's this ongoing and intense battle between nature and uh, and um, synthetic. And it's, and it's going to continue, but uh, we, we will win in the long run. Absolutely. And when... How many decades has IVC, intravenous vitamin C, been around for? It's been around for a very long time. It's been around for a very long time. Uh, Linus Pauling started using it um, oh, quite a long time ago. And I think he was using around about 10 grams, 10,000 milligrams, uh, when he did the studies on uh, uh, cancer. Um, and those studies showed that his cancer patients uh, survived longer and had a better quality of life. Then Mattel and colleagues at the Mayo Clinic did a study and they selected very sick cancer patients. I, I believe they only gave the, these cancer patients oral vitamin C uh, and uh, they stopped it after a period of time. And of course, when you do something like that, you're not going to get the same good result. And uh, so therefore, uh, the conclusion was that uh, vitamin C doesn't work with cancer. Um, but we know it. <laughs> we know it does. Uh, and... Uh, even the antagonists in New Zealand, who uh, used to be highly critical of me when I'd go over there and lecture uh, about vitamin C and cancer, um, are now doing research, which is nice, and finding and the research is working. As well as cancer, for example, I have a colleague, a young person who recently had IVC to, to get over glandular fever more quickly. Could you give a quick rundown of many of the conditions that you've actually observed in your in your practice to have been far more rapidly improved through the use of IVC? I can do a, a quick and brief rundown, and I can do it in one sentence. Human beings, unlike most other animals, apart from the higher apes, the guinea pig and the Indian fruit bat, do not manufacture their own vitamin C from glucose. And therefore, they require extraneous sources of vitamin C for virtually every known condition that a patient will present with. So you tell me uh, a condition and I'll tell you the vitamin C requirements. So if somebody with a psychiatric condition as I said before, uh, somebody with a, a psychiatric problem may either be malnourished or toxic. Uh, I received a patient from a city hospital uh, many years ago. She uh, had three operations for plastic surgery, face, breasts, and, and tummy. She had infected wounds in the tummy. And she was, she'd been drinking milkshakes out of a straw for the last five days or so. And she uh, went into acute psychosis. She was uncontrollable with ECT, uh, paraldehyde, and she was sent to uh, uh, myself and a psychiatrist at the hospital that I was uh, uh, had admitting rights to. And um, I said, what are we going to do with her? So I put up a drip, an intravenous infusion of vitamin C and magnesium and I think at the time, some bigger vitamins as well. And we saturated her with vitamin C. And within an hour or so, she'd settled down. Uh, later that night, I, I got called by the nuns, the, the nuns and the nurses, that uh, Maria had uh, become agitated again. And I said, uh, what's changed? And uh, I said, we don't know. Uh, we just turned the drip off because she was, she was so well. I said, ah, you put the drip back on again. Turn it up. And, you know, and the, she settled down again and went to sleep. She had infected wounds, so she was toxic. And she'd been drinking, rub, drinking milkshakes, so she was probably uh, malnourished in some respect. And, you know, it's, it's classic. When you see something like this, Jody, it, it, it's, it's, it's heart-rendering and it's an intellectual exercise. And you have to ask, why, are these things, why, why, why do these things happen? Uh, how do they happen? I mean, so let, acute, for, we could for another example might be shingles. Shingles. I mean, it's, it's it's a it's a reactivated virus. 
uh, it's uh, a reactivated virus. It's interfering with the, uh, the immune system. You're getting blisters in the skin. You're getting pain. You're getting inflammation. So what does vitamin C do? Vitamin C inhibits the, the replication of viruses. Vitamin C is an anti-inflammatory. Vitamin C uh, has um, um, analgesic effects uh, and vitamin C has uh, sedating effects. So you've got all of the things in the one substance. It also stimulates uh, your white blood cells. It stimulates interferon production. It stimulates um, complement. It stimulates uh, the killer cell. It it, it it actually acts as an oxidant as well. So the oxidizing activity of uh, vitamin C via peroxide uh, kills the viruses. So it does everything and it also helps. If we're looking at either a child or an adult or an elderly person, how would you look at treating them differently with vitamin C? Well, with a child, uh, I'd be giving it orally. If the child was moribund, uh, and this has happened, you give it uh, parenterally. You give it a, an either an intramuscular injection of a small dose and repeatedly, or you put up an intravenous infusion uh, for children and you give them one dose, one gram per year of age to start with if they're severely ill. Uh, with uh, teenagers, you try to give an IV, uh, usually a quick one in the anticubital, in, in, in the veins in, the, uh, in front of the elbow. Um, and you don't necessarily have to give high levels of high uh, levels of uh, infusions you can give a, a quick push of say 10 to 20 thousand milligrams uh, you get a rapid increase in blood levels and that rapid increase in blood levels saturates your tissues uh, and you know it frightens the daylights out of the viruses and and the elderly same you'd be gentle with the elderly you 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 don't give it in in the same large doses as you would somebody with an acute severe viral infection in their uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. You, you uh, have to be more gentle with the elderly, but uh, you uh, you drip it in slowly and uh, and frequently so that they, uh, they've got a chance to uh, adopt to it, adapt to it, because it, it does have a very profound effect on a lot of mechanisms, uh, the redox mechanisms, reduction ox oxidation systems in the body, uh, and these the elderly people have uh, lazy enzymes. They've got proteins that are that are not uh, well structured. Uh, they, they're um, old and worn out. So you don't want to put you know high octane fuel in in a model T model forward. It feels to me as if doctors must be really frustrated the, the doctors that haven't sort of brought together integrative medicine into their practice because they there's they must understand that they've only got half or a, even a quarter really of the toolkit needed but if they were to start prescribing the, the vitamin c intravenously for example they would be at risk of being reported because they would be outside protocol how how does how do we change this um, well, we change it very slowly, Jody. I mean, when I started, uh, I was because I had started the College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, and I, and I was the, the president. Uh, I, I was the the target for the medical boards um, on many occasions, and any any pathetic reason for calling me before the board, they would. But that was back in the days when they didn't just suspend you; um, you had to do something pretty seriously wrong. Uh, to be suspended or struck off. They tried to strike me off and uh, they failed. Uh, after an appeal to the Supreme Court, they were very embarrassed. But the, 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 uh, the situation has improved over the years. Uh, and now, you know, the orthodoxy will say, oh, vitamin C, yes, it, 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 there's evidence that it works. I mean, you know, the three stages of, of discovery, first of all, it's nonsense, it's rubbish, it's quackery, it's snake oil, snake sales type stuff. And then the second stage is, uh, there's some evidence, but really we're not convinced. You know, we need a lot more evidence and it's not really something we really want to do. And then the third stage is, oh, there's a lot of evidence for this stuff, isn't it? Great, you know, we, we really suspected it was going to work all the time. And that's what's happening now. That's what's happening now. <laughs> the my, my adversaries who are not dead and still alive, are starting to realize that um, it's it's uh, it's pr a profoundly powerful medicine and um, which is which is joy to me but 
we've still got medical boards in New Zealand and Australia who are very antagonistic towards doctors who speak out about anything that's not drug-based medicine. Um, and uh, they do that because they are paid by the pharmaceutical companies directly or indirectly uh, to suppress good health care uh, because the drug companies just don't want good health care. They, they, they call what they do uh, health care, but our health care, our health departments are so far away from health, it's not funny. I mean, we've got hospitals now that can't accept patients. We've got ambulances ramping up at the hospitals. Uh, and ambulances with patients in them who have ramped up in the hospitals, calling a MICA ambulance to come in and help them in the ambulance outside the hospital. You know, they have made a real mess of the system here, but they they, uh, they will help be held accountable one of these days because these bureaucrats uh, do not know what they're doing, or if they do know what they're doing, what they're doing is damaging, the, uh, damaging our health care systems, damaging... Our, our culture, our society, uh, and they are a threat, as far as I'm concerned, to, to our civilization. And we can see, and I'll put a chart up, that in New Zealand in the last uh, 10 years or so, the pharmaceutical budget has doubled from uh, 0.8 to 1.6 billion. And at the same time, the population really hasn't shifted that much. So it's it's important to understand that nutrition hasn't hasn't been granted that same voice but one of the one of the nice interesting things that's come out of COVID is that vitamin d in new zealand is not permitted to be prescribed uh for anything but a musculoskeletal problem so the the, the authorities are refusing to acknowledge that there is a connection for example with the prevention of lower respiratory tract in infection um, but somehow the use of vitamin d keeps and i'll put that chart keeps going up in a, in a quite, uh, you know, insistent fashion. So I have the impression that there's probably a few medical doctors out there that are, their patients have a slight musculoskeletal issue perhaps, but they possibly may know that there, there are greater benefits for vitamin D than just musculoskeletal issues. Do you think that might be correct? Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. I mean, there's, there's a lot more uh, in the public who are aware of it now. Um, you know, the alternative media, this sort of media that we're on now, uh, has been uh, spreading a lot of information around about uh, self-help and re self taking responsibility for your own health care. Um, people have been uh, disappointed about the way uh, COVID has managed, uh, lockdowns and all that sort of thing. And uh, Reading more about uh, when the lockdowns occur, there's no opportunity to do proper exercise or get it out of the sunshine. And uh, of course, both of those uh, parameters are contributing to a weakened immune system and will contribute to more uh, uh, COVID. So uh, yes, the, the first quarter of 2020, um, we did quite a lot of um, uh, public speaking about vitamin D, C and zinc. Uh, I wrote to our health minister and prime minister and the chief medical officer, the AMA, RACGP, many organizations about the importance of C, D and zinc. Uh, and um, our wealthiest woman, um, Gina Reinhardt, uh, picked up one of my papers from a, a doctor's room on vitamin C, D, and zinc, put it up on her uh, Hancock pro Prospecting website. Uh, she's got thousands of, uh, of employees. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was all about C, D, and zinc. So, And could well, you get published in the paper? Sorry, sorry? Could you get published in the newspapers? Yes, up until... Um, July, August of 2020, uh, I paid a public relations company to uh, help me get uh, some articles in the newspapers and magazines, and we did. We even got something in the uh, in the newspapers in London about vitamin D. We were focusing on vitamin D at the time. So uh, up until mid-2020, uh, we were able to, and then the journalist who uh, was doing the writing for me um, and publications uh, basically said, sorry, we can't do any more. Sorry, we can't do any more. You know, that's mainstream media. They're uh, captured, and they are captured by um, the big industry, the big end of town. Uh, and this, to me, is, I have to use the word evil. I can't use any other word, it's evil. Uh, and we are in a spiritual battle between the spiritual good 
and evil. And unfortunately, many people in this world are working within evil systems and doing a good job and honestly believe that they're doing a good job and, and satisfy there was, themselves. That they're doing there was a, a lot job. of literature in Germany about how good people just did what they were told. So I, I think you're, you're correct there. And I think one of the most important things for us to recognise is that right now our children and our adolescents and our young people, our under 25s, are consuming more ultra processed food they're consuming more medication than previous generations and this has largely been ignored the the multiple morbidity the idea that teenagers might be on diabetes medication they might be on medication for constipation they might be on medication for um for adhd and anxiety or and, and uh, depression and they might be on one or two others they might have asthma so we can easily today have have teenagers that are on a cocktail of drugs but in the waiting room when they go in to see the doctor the doctor is not allowed, not able to prescribe uh, complex formulations of nutrients and uh, support them in a change away from their diet because that's not that's not seen as science. So you know the we, 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 it's a it's you know you you talk about evil, but it's deeply immoral. The, the doctor, the government is there stopping, uh, I would say, medical doctors from actually giving these kids nutrients and uh, advice that actually would help them move away from the multiple drugs they're on. How, what would you say if a, a young, you know, 19, 17 year old walked into your clinic and was on all those medications? How do you make it real for them that this is not necessarily who they are defined as? Well, it's it's because our system has allowed them to grow up and, and believe that going to the doctor will make you uh, better if you get sick. And therefore, I don't need to take any responsibility for maintaining my health. And so uh, we grow up uh, thinking like that, then it's easy for the marketers to sell us um, seed oils, sugar and white flour. And nearly every junk food consists of seed oils, white flour and, uh, and sugar. And you just only have to have uh, a little bit of a, a coloring or a flavoring, uh, flavoring added to it and maybe some nuts on top or whatever. And you've got something that's called a food. And it's not a food, it's an empty calorie piece of rubbish. And, uh, but it's nourish because the, the psychologists working in the food industry know that salt and sugar will actually uh, include palatability uh, and the seed oils will add to palatability, give it the mouthfeel, and therefore you end up eating a lot of this rubbish. And the more you eat this rubbish, the more your microbiome in the gut suffers. Therefore, your gut's going to produce disease in your system. Then it, it, therein lies the vicious cycle. And that cycle has to be beaten, broken. Because these patients are very difficult to treat unless you can put them in a health resort or a hospital that knows what they're doing. And I, I was fortunate to have a couple of hospitals that I had access to, admitting rights to, back in the days when I was you know, flat out running a, um, a medical uh, centre. And uh, we can, could detoxify these patients, nourish them and get them out of hospital, whether they had psychiatric illnesses, uh, diabetes, uh, autoimmune diseases, whatever you name it. But they all got vitamin C, Jody. They all got vitamin C. If you want to change... If you want to make a big change to health in the Western industrialized nations, put everybody on two to 4,000 milligrams of vitamin C, observe what happens, and then treat the rest. In that way, we could save trillions of dollars in the, in the um, industrialized West. But uh, until people realize that we don't manufacture our own vitamin C when we're under stress, and we're under stress all the time, living inside a house, uh, going outside, having a shower in the morning, brushing your teeth, you know, you name it. Uh, we are under chemical, physical, electrical, electromagnetic stressors and that the people around us are also stressed out uh, and that's a stress on us as well. So, uh, and, and what is the best thing for stress? Vitamin C. Ow, of course, uh, having good sleep, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want to get rid of those radicals in your system from all that stress, uh, the ascorbate is the best thing to do. Well, in my opinion, it's the best thing to do. It's the quickest, it's the easiest. But to, to treat that case that you're talking about uh, is going to require family, friends, uh, change in, in social attitudes, 
because uh, they don't want to be seen to be an outsider. They don't want to say have to say, no, I can't have a Coke or I can't have a Big Mac or, or um, go to the pub for a beer or whatever. I mean, our, our, our society and culture, uh, it, it's, it's great. You know, uh, we've got some great things, but we also do a lot of damage to ourselves. Yes, and the the industry understands how the addictive potential of these foods. And I've done a couple of rec recent interviews uh, with uh, research scientists in uh, the UK and the USA because the addictive potential is part of what is driving these kids back. And so until we have coaching to, to support that shift away from this prefrontal cortex stress, you, you you will see that 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 wandering back even if they don't want to and for and uh, and uh, we're we're nearly getting to the end of our interview what would your recommendations be for uh children and adults in, at winter time for vitamin d well I, I, the first thing is is uh have whole milk if you're going to drink milk Preferably uh, goat's milk or sheep's milk. Uh, eat plenty of fat fish, fatty fish, um, because you get some vitamin D out of the fish. You get vitamin D out of the mushrooms. Uh, not that much, but some. Uh, and if you don't get enough sunshine, I mean, if you can go outside and get full, full strength, uh, uh, full spectrum, uh, natural sunlight, um, then go and get some, you know, 20 minutes with your arms and your face and a bit of your chest exposed. Um, it all adds up. Uh, and um, if you need supplementation, and I do recommend supplementation during the winter between 2,000 and 4,000 international units for 60 to 70 kilogram adults uh, and proportionate doses for uh, uh, lower weights and for children. Um, and have your plasma vitamin D levels checked and if they're, as I mentioned before, below certain levels, get them up, get them up above 120 to 125 nanomoles per liter. Just remember 120 is enough. Uh, and uh, then, then go and study uh, your nutrients, and uh, in particular vitamin D. What are the three things that you would think of uh, suggesting to a young medical doctor in their first five years to look at? Well, in the first five years, I would say, be humble. Know that knowledge never stops. You never stop learning. Uh, and um, try to remove your ego out of any situation that you might come across when you are challenged. Uh, the other thing I would say is persist and uh, and believe in yourself. So they're, they're the pieces of advice um, that I would give a, a, young, a young graduate. Um, because when you graduate, sometimes you're told you, you know more than you'll ever know uh, by the time you've finished your final exams. Um, that's not quite true, but, um, but also some of the uh, uh, graduation ceremonies have been uh, Sort of punctuated by a statement like um, by the time you've graduated uh, we've taught you a lot 50 percent of what you took we've taught you is you know true and good science and the other 50 percent is bs and the problem is we don't know which 50 percent is which so um i mean it's sarcastic it's it's uh, a bit cynical um but again i, I hark on Humility, because um, if you're humble and you continue learning, you'll be the great doctor that you want to be. That's beautiful. And I just have one more, one more issue that we haven't spoken about, because what we see is an enormous problem with iatrogenesis, it is with drug-drug interactions. Young doctors spend a lot of their time being anxious that there won't be a drug-drug interaction or an interaction with food. What... As you move into a nutritional medicine landscape, what are your concerns with adverse effects from
from the nutrients you prescribe, particularly at high dose. What are your concerns with that? There, there are concerns, but it's usually with the fat-soluble vitamins um, and the, uh, the storage of, of that fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A uh, and vitamin D. But um, the, the doses, the high doses that we recommend are not toxic and uh, they don't accumulate. Um, apart from the fact that we used to, we used to, and sometimes uh, some of us use high doses of vitamin A, very high doses of vitamin A in certain cancers and epithelial cancers in particular. You reduce the toxicity of the vitamin A with vitamin C. Okay. Um, when in doubt, vitamin C. And, uh, you know, I, I used to always uh, teach the, uh, the younger doctors that, that the best physician I have ever, ever met was the uh, physician who admitted the, the patient into hospital and took them off all of their medication. And we're hearing a lot more of that, that we're hearing courage. Yes. Thank well, you. Every, every medication is a, is a potential poison uh, and we're not taught about uh, toxicology enough in, uh, in medicine, but all of, all of the medicines are poisons. And we know that there is such a thing as uh, lethal synergism, which means the synergism between uh, acceptable levels of, of chemicals. You get to a point where you've got a combination of chemicals and it becomes lethal. It may not be immediately lethal, but it's toxic in the long run. And this is what a lot of people who are multi-medications are suffering from toxic uh, uh, lethal, uh, potential lethal toxicities or harmful uh, levels of uh, synergistic uh, toxins that um, are keeping them sick. And you, know, you get a, a, another illness on top of every drug that you're given uh, or symptoms. So you're given another medication to, 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 to quell that uh, side effect down. Uh, and it's just a, a vicious cycle towards um, a spiral of, illness and disease and that's what we've got to try and stop and that's why i think you mentioned about the courage that young doctors require yes yeah i mean let me say there's an old saying and I've, i'm not sure who actually said it but it's fairly well known without courage there's no truth and without truth there are no other there are no other um What's the word I'm looking for? Virtues. That's beautiful. That's a really good way to end this on. Thank you so much, Professor Ian Brighthope. It's been such a pleasure interviewing you today. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope at some stage we'll speak again. Well, I hope so too. Thank you very much. It's been nice to be with you. Thank you.